scripture this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 in the New Revised Standard Version found on page 197 in your pew Bible. Therefore, my beloved, just as I have always obeyed, you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of God for the people of God. Today we're asking the question, how can I ever change? Now most of us are interested in change, amen. Bestseller lists perennially include self-help books directed at change. We attend conferences, seminars, read books, and listen to materials that are geared at helping us achieve change or transformation in our lives. More importantly, God wants us to change. A life that is never willing to change is a great waste of potential. Change is a necessary part of a growing life, and we need change if we are going to remain fresh and keep progressing. So when it comes to changing your life, what part is God's and what part is yours? I'm glad you asked. That passage that Gene just read us from Philippians helps to answer that question. Let's read that one more time. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Think of it this way, church. In a physical workout, you are working out what you already have, which are the muscles God has given to you. In our passage, God doesn't say that you have to earn your salvation. God says, use what you already have or work out, cultivate, develop what God is working in you. And it's that symbiotic relationship that is the foundation for change. It is God leading the way, but we have to partner with God in order for change to occur. And one of my favorite biblical characters when it comes to the topic of change is Peter. And Peter undergoes several changes throughout the course of his life. Our first introduction to Peter is when he's working in his boat with his brother Andrew, and they're fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus calls both Peter and Andrew to follow him, and immediately, we're told, they drop and leave everything and follow Jesus. So Peter goes from being a fisherman to being a disciple of Jesus. He might not have initially understood the impact of his life-changing decision to follow Jesus, but he seems to have a clearer understanding as time goes by. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say? that I am. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Peter gets it. He knows that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. He confesses that. He proclaims it. But he doesn't seem to know exactly what that looks like or means for Jesus or for the disciples. And on the night of the Passover, Jesus tries to explain it to Peter and the other disciples. We pick that up in Matthew 26. Then Jesus said to them, you all will become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. 
And so said all the disciples. I don't know about you, but I love Peter's boldness here. He says, I will never desert you. And Jesus says, look, Peter, not only are you going to desert me, but you're also going to deny me three times. And Peter ups the ante in his response, and he says, even though I must die with you, I will not, I will not deny you. Peter doesn't think there's any way, after all this time, he's going to deny Jesus. He's going to remain resolute, he believes, in the changes that he has made. But we know how the story goes. Jesus is eventually arrested. He's taken to the high priest. Peter follows closely behind at a safe distance, though, to see what's going to happen. And as he's hanging out in the courtyard outside the high priest's house, he's approached three different times and asked about Jesus. And each time he denies knowing Jesus. After the third time, Peter hears the rooster crow, and he remembers Jesus' words to him, and he runs away, and he weeps bitterly. Well, like Peter, we know that the road to change is often a difficult one. It's a road that is filled with bumps, with detours, with obstacles. And three primary things that can keep you and I from changing are denial, fear, and failure. One of the easiest ways for us to avoid the hard work of change is to deny that the need for change even exists in the first place. And we convince others and ourselves that change isn't necessary or needed. We say things like, you know, I, I don't need to eat healthier. Yeah, I eat a triple cheeseburger with large fries and wash it down with a large drink every day for lunch, but a lot of people do that. I, I don't need to stop smoking. A pack a day is nothing. I know people who smoke three packs a day. I, I don't need to cut back on drinking. If you were married to my spouse, you'd drink too. <laughs> don't laugh too loud at that one. I don't need to read my Bible or go to worship. God knows my heart. It's so easy for us to deny the need for change. A fear can also keep us from changing. There, the hard work of change, it comes with some fear. It comes with some what ifs. You know, what if it's too hard? What if I can't do it? What if no one is there to help me? What, what if they make fun of me? What if something goes wrong? There in that courtyard, Peter let his fear dictate his words and his actions. We can play the what if game all day and let our fear talk us out of trying to change. A failure can keep us from changing because it makes us give up. It becomes easy to say, you know, look, I knew I couldn't do it. I don't even know why I bothered trying in the first place. There's no point. Life is just always going to be like this. But what you and I need to understand is that failure is often just a temporary setback for an even greater comeback. Failure is often just a temporary setback for an even greater comeback. Peter didn't have his story end in that courtyard, praise God. That, that wasn't the end. You know, he could have spent the rest of his life crying over that moment that he failed in the courtyard, but God had bigger and better things planned for Peter. You know, God, through the Holy Spirit, makes it possible for Peter to change. And I love what the promise that kind of is the catalyst for this that Jesus gives in John 14. And Jesus says this, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Again, it wasn't the end of Peter's story in the courtyard. It was just a temporary setback for an even greater comeback. Amen. Now, after his resurrection, Jesus tells the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise, God's promise, of the Holy Spirit. You see, up to this point, the Holy Spirit had only been poured out on certain people. The gift of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't available to everyone. It wasn't universal yet. But then this happens in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. So at this point, the Holy Spirit is available to everyone. The Holy Spirit is now universal. And what does Peter do? Well, he goes from being the scared, sad, and defeated disciple to being the faithful, joyful, and spirit-filled disciple that stands up in front of a huge crowd and preaches a sermon. And he's doing this after people have made fun of him and the other disciples, as Diane talked about, where they say, oh, they're just drunk. They've had too much wine. That's all that's going on here. But Peter silences the crowd, and he goes on to preach a sermon that can be summed up in verses 32 and 33 of Acts 2. 
this Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured, this, has poured out this that you both see and hear. So in other words, he is saying, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, it's the pouring out, it's the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And the crowd is enthralled with what Peter has to say, and they want to know how to respond. They want to know what to do. And Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus so that your sins will be forgiven and so that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you know how many people entered into a relationship with Jesus that day after Peter preached the sermon? 3,000. Not three, not 300, 3,000. That's a pretty good sermon, amen? Peter was doing some work on that day. Peter was able to change because the Holy Spirit made it possible. When that same way for us, church, God through the Holy Spirit makes change possible for us. Now, there are some ways I, I want to share with you, three tools, really, that God uses to bring about change in our lives. And the first one is what we've already been talking about on this Pentecost Sunday. God uses the Holy Spirit to change us. God uses the Holy Spirit to change us. It is the Spirit that works in us. It is the Spirit that makes you and I more like Jesus. That was Jesus' promise to his disciples and us, the promise that the Holy Spirit would make us like him. God wants us to be transformed. God wants to change us, and that starts with the Holy Spirit working in us. And remember, we work out what God works in. A second tool that God uses to change us is the Bible. When was the last time you read something from 2 Timothy, church? Any time recently? No? Let's do that this morning. Let's do that. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. If you are truly serious about changing your life, get into the Word each and every day. Not just every now and then, but each and every day. Spend some time in your Bible. A third tool that God uses to change us is our circumstances. And even those circumstances that aren't so good, those situations in our life that aren't good, God can use to bring good out of. Now, I want to be careful with that because I'm not saying God is the one causing that tough time. But God can use that tough time to bring about good. You know, in the Old Testament story of Joseph, God isn't the one who caused his brothers to sell him into slavery. That wasn't God. That was them. But God was able to bring good out of that into Joseph's life. God can bring good out of any and all circumstances. Amen. I want to bring things home by sharing three ways that you can cooperate, you can partner with God to bring about change in your life. And the first is you can choose to depend on the Holy Spirit. I love this passage from John 15 that talks about the branch and the vine. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. The branch is totally dependent on the main vine. If we are totally dependent on the Holy Spirit, then we will have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us that answer in Galatians 5. The Apostle says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the kind of fruit that we want to produce in our lives. Amen. And finally, we can choose what we think about. We can choose what we think about. That's a hard one because your thoughts not only shape your life, but they can also become your life. The battle against sin, it always starts in the mind. It always starts right here. That's why it's so important for us to meditate on the Word of God each and every day as we talked about earlier. You have to win the battle of the mind of change is going to happen. You can choose your response to life. You can't control everything that happens in your life, but you can choose your response to it. You can choose how you respond to any and all circumstances that you face. Church, change is possible. And because of that, I challenge and encourage you to be intentional about change and to be patient with change because God isn't finished with you yet. And thanks be to God for that. Amen.